let me come back to that and cover some gravity topics. So I copied this figure here to illustrate what you will cover. It'll illustrate the one the the geometrical aspect of what you will see when we when you cover when we cover uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation. So this is what Newton's law of universal gravitation says. It says when you have two massive bodies with some masses m1 and m2, then there is an attractive force between them. There's a <clears throat> there's a, a force. Um, uh, let's uh, for clarity's sake, let's say force on one by two. Then this attractive force is proportional to the uh, product to the mass between mass of each of them. So m1 times m2, and it's inversely proportional to the distance between them. Let me call that our distance between them, one, two, square. Now, since it's a force, a vector quantity, we should be able to do better than describe this with some proportionality. Um, since we are describing, um, we are describing force, and we want to do better than this proportionality thing. So um, in order to be able to say that force is equal to something, we introduce the constant capital G, which is, um, well, it's capital G, it's uh, uh, Newton's gravitational constant G. Now, having gone up to this point, it, um, we should be able to do actually even better than this. This is what I was trying to say. Um, because we, are, we know we are dealing with a force, which is, uh, yeah, we are, dealing with the force, which is a vector quantity. So we want to be able to describe what's on the right-hand side as a vector quantity. That's where this particular, um, this particular diagram is useful. So, because, you know, nothing on this uh, right hand side relates to a direction. It's just uh, describing the magnitude. So now you need a you need a vector that matches up with the direction of this vector to give you um, to give you a, a vector quantity. So you say, all right. Um, so if it's a force on object one by two. Uh, so Newton's law of universal gravitation, it's describing an attractive force. So this force uh, on one by two has to point in the direction of the, of the object two. So um, to help describe all of this, you define a unit vector R12, which points from mass one to mass two then to attach a sense of direction to this expression here, all you have to do is say the, the gravitational force is this magnitude times r from one to two hat. Now there's a, something that's a, a bit um, not quite satisfactory uh, about this particular description. Normally, um, for example, when we want to describe acceleration, we like to divide out the mass m1. That you know cancels out this m1, and you have this magnitude that's described only in terms of m2. But this particular unit vector, it points from m1 to m2. So it, I guess though reason way in which it's not satisfactory is if we wanted to attach a, attach an axis, coordinate axis with the system, then the natural thing to do is attach that at the point of mass two, which you are still including in your description. And in that case, you really want to say instead, this is a unit vector R21, 
which um, refers to the other locations as viewed from a point of the object too. And if you do that, what you have to make sure is that you make sure that there's a minus sign here because the uh, force one, two is pointing in the opposite direction from R to one. So, all right, uh, but I guess uh, maybe I can kind of highlight this as we are doing the task that um, I'm actually here to do, which is to derive the expression for gravitational potential energy. So uh, maybe let's do that. Um, doing that will also give you uh, another way to, uh, to be careful about how you handle directions as you're describing the, the law of, uh, as you're describing um, universal gravity. So, so, all right, um, maybe we should start out with description of potential energy. It's been a while, so it's good to um, describe that. Um, it's good to start out with the description of potential energy. And um, really, um, it's not the potential energy itself that's uh, defined or is useful. What is always useful instead is the change in potential energy. And the definition for change in potential energy let's say as you go from A to B is this. It's uh, the amount of work done and we want to be careful about this work done. We want this work done by a conservative force. So if uh, an applied force is doing work that doesn't turn into potential energy. And the work that you're doing would be as an object moves from point A to B. And finally, what's important to hear is that it's negative. Oh, let me use different color. It's the minus of the work done by conservative force. You attach a conservative force doing negative work as a positive change in potential energy. Or if the work done by conservative force is positive, then that ought to be associated with a negative potential energy because positive work done involves uh, potential energy decreasing so the kinetic energy can increase. So, so this is how we always describe potential energy. Now, um, there's a bit of, um, uh, there's a convention that I want to introduce. So this, uh, this uh, change language, you know, change from A to B, that makes it hard to have a kind of just a simple expression for potential energy. Uh, like, um, so this is what I would love to be able to do. Love to be able to say, almost like with the kinetic energy and speed, I'd love to be able to say, that if I have some mass that's uh, sitting in some, I don't know, vastness of uh, space somewhere, I would love to be able to say that if I have some small mass and some distance, then I would like to be able to just to tell you what potential energy is as a function of the distance. Just the way you can with the kinetic energy, if this object is moving at some speed, then we would, uh, would hesitate for a minute to give you the kinetic energy as a function of the speed. You'll need other parameters like mass of the object and whatnot, but you can specify kinetic energy as a function of a single variable. And, or sorry, speed, not, uh, not position. So I would love to be able to describe the function of V, a single variable. And I'd love to be able to do that with the potential energy. But as long as we are describing change in potential energy, what we have to constantly do is describe this in terms of the change in potential energy from some initial to final position. And that's very limiting, very cumbersome, very um, whatever. Um, 
what it would be wonderful for us to be able to do is to say this change in potential energy is say that it's potential energy at some point minus potential energy at some reference point. And come to think of it, that is what we do all the time. Uh, we, uh, for example, uh, when we are analyzing, like, you know, uh, when we are doing this uh, kind of analysis with the potential energy being MGH, then what we always do either implicitly or explicitly, we define where the height is measured from. So the point where H is zero, that's our reference point whatever the potential energy is at that point, that's our reference potential energy. We are setting this uh, reference to be zero. And um, so that allows us to talk about potential energy as a function of just height, because height is measured in reference to something. And uh, we would like to be able to do something similar here. Now, the challenge you run into is, um, is this, ref is this reference going to be some context dependent thing that unless you specify each time in a question that there's gonna be ambiguity where the reference is. And in general, that's the case. That's why I led by saying it's the, oops, uh, that's why I led by saying it's the change in potential energy that's meaningful. Now, um, when you're dealing with something like a gravity, which is inverse square law, which means it, uh, the gravitational, gravitational force goes to zero as your distance goes out to infinity, it turns out there's a special reference point you can use. That's a universal reference point. And that universal reference point is infinity. It's uh, analogous to you, um, uh, our Earth-based navigators using the stars as the, as the reference point because the stars are so far away, whether you are, uh, wherever you are on the Earth, you see the same set of stars or, um, I mean, you know, depending, well. So uh, however much you, your position changes around the Earth, that doesn't change your distance to the stars very much. So that's what we would like to do here. In the calculation of gravitational potential energy for universal gravitation, by which I mean we, have, we are in the regime where we have to treat gravitational force as being the inverse square law. We want to, um, we want to treat this point A as not being some generic point A, but infinity. This is our universal reference point for gravitational potential energy. So let me do the calculation of gravitational potential energy using, oops, uh, using, this, as the, using this as the premise. This is, um, this is kind of the uh, paradigm that I'll use to calculate the change in potential energy. Then, um, so then this is basically what you have. So to calculate this change in potential energy, what we have to do is we have to calculate the work done as the mass moves from infinity to a particular point B and uh, work on by gravity. Once we calculate that, we can just put minus a sign in front of it. That is the definition of change in potential energy. Now, the, from the moment you think about doing this, uh, you should uh, run into this conceptual problem. So we define work this way. Work done is force that product with displacement. Now, here's the conundrum or dilemma or whatever. Um, oops, sorry, went a little bit ahead of myself. Um, 
in this particular calculation, it looks like my displacement is infinite, coming in from infinity to some finite distance. The distance is infinite. So how is the work done not infinite? This is where you have to realize that your force is a variable. So when you are infinitely far away, your force was zero. So, um, so when you do this calculation carefully, this uh, force dot product with the displacement won't turn out to be infinity, but instead it'll turn out to be some finite quantity. And so what you have to, um, so what you have to realize here is that you can't just use this uh, simple formula directly. Instead, you have to deal with the variable force. So what you are going to do is you are going to calculate a small infinitesimal amount of work done um, as the as the object here as the object here moves an infinitesimal distance dx and when you make this interval dx small enough, you can say that the amount of force that's acting is um, it's more or less constant. Even though it's a function of r, it will be varying over a large enough interval. You say that, um, so imagining this, uh, this interval, taking, uh, taking it in from infinity, you imagine breaking this up into small enough interval that for each of these small intervals of dx, you can say that the um, that this distance r is more or less the same. So you can say that force um, over this interval dx is force at point r. Right? So the mathematical procedure you use to add up each one of these infinitesimal change in uh, energy due to work done is integration. You, so um, that's, a, uh, <laughs> that's the intuition you have to develop. So here, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to uh, start by expressing this uh, infinitesimal amount of work done over one of these representative intervals. And we imagine doing this for first interval, second interval, third interval, so on for really infinite number of intervals. And when you add up all that, that's going to be expressed by integral over uh, the whole, I guess, infinite interval, actually. So let's do that. Uh, let me first write down the expression for infinitesimal amount of work done, dw. So that's going to be uh, what will be force um, that product with dx or displacement. I'm writing this symbolically up there so that I can write down the actual expressions down here carefully. So the, so the direction of force, um, so I'm, uh, so, you know, for this mess here, this is the direction of the force. So the magnitude will be simple. It'll be G times, um, I guess the symbols I used are small m times big M over the distance squared. That's the magnitude of force. And um, magnitude of dx, I guess uh, if I'm being careful, it, I want to, since this r is my coordinate variable, what I want to do is I want to express this uh, interval size uh, in terms of this coordinate variable r. So this should be dr. Um, that's the, the amount by infinitesimal amount by which r is changing. So this dx should be dr. And what I need to be careful here is this. Um, it's the relative direction of the force and dx. So the force points inward. Good. 
and oh this is where i have to be careful um <laughs> there's a joke that says uh, a good physicist is one that makes an odd number of sign errors no sorry even number of sign errors <laughs> there's a very good chance i'm gonna end up making sign errors um uh I think what I need to do is I need to look ahead to where I'll be actually expressing this integral. So what I want to do is, so um, I, I have some sense in which uh, how this uh, dot product should go. This dot product here, it should give me a positive number because the force and the displacement is going in the same direction. So over this uh, interval, gravitational force is, is doing positive work, which will, will result in negative potential energy change. So when I'm all done, when I do this integration, when I integrate this infinitesimal change over the whole interval, and that means I'm going from r equals infinity to some um, oops, maybe I should start uh, to some particular fixed point r prime then I want this uh, entire quantity to come out to be positive so um, what I do is I make sure I choose the correct signs to be sure that's what happens um, so <laughs> I guess uh, what I'm trying to get at is, um, so because the force is pointing towards the origin, I need to have minus a sign here. That, that's one part. I think that much uh, makes sense. And now for this interval portion, even though my uh, displacement is also pointing towards the origin, I'm going to leave this dr alone. Reason being this, my interval go going from infinity to r prime, that already accounts for this inward direction. And I don't want to double count for the inward direction by also putting a minus sign here. So I'm going to omit the minus sign here. And really what my check will be is that when I do this integral, I better end up with a positive number. If I don't, then I made an, an odd number of sign errors and I should just fix the sign so that the final answer comes out right. This is where in good intuition is useful. Um, all right, so let me, uh, let me do this calculation. I, been talk I talked a lot, let me finish this math and be done with it. Uh, this is one of the, um, I don't, I guess you still call this polynomial integral. Uh, so this is, uh, let me pull out all the constant quantities. Uh, constant quantities are minus G, M, M. So what remains here inside the integral is dr over r squared, r going from infinity to r prime. Uh, this integral, hopefully everyone knows how to do it. Uh, this is a polynomial integral of this form. Uh, r to the power of minus two dr. So uh, when you integrate it, you should get uh, the anti derivative for this should be um, minus r to the minus one. That should be the anti derivative. You can always double check your anti derivative by taking derivative of it. That brings down a factor of minus one, canceling out this minus and then the exponent changes to original minus one. So you get minus two, that seems right. <laughs> Always double check your antiderivative when you're doing it in your head. So with that, uh, what we get for this integral is minus G M M, the antiderivative minus um, R to the power of minus one evaluated at the limit of r prime and infinity. So 
finish writing this out. It uh, um, minus r prime or minus one over r prime uh, and minus minus so plus one over infinity or I mean there's a proper way to write it. However you write it, the end result is that this term is zero. Um, so I have this quantity here, which has two minus signs. So cancel out those two minus signs and I end with following expression uh, uh, as my result of calculation, G times product of the masses divided by R prime or the R, the distance where you end up at. And what I've calculated is a change in it, uh, or that change in energy, amount of work done going from infinity, infinity to that particular fixed point. And what I need to remember is that the, the what I need to remember is that change in potential energy is minus of this. So since this is the amount of work done, what should be the gravitational potential energy, let's say at point R prime, using that universal reference point of infinity as, um, um, so where I said potential energy at R goes to infinity to zero, that's what using that universal reference point means. The potential energy at R prime is negative of the quantity. So minus G M M over R prime. This is the expression for the gravitational potential energy. And this is the formula that uh, we are using elsewhere where we use it without derivation. Um, hopefully this uh, makes intuitive sense. When you plot it, this is what it looks like. The potential energy, uh, let me do this in different color. Um, potential energy as a function of, as a function of distance r, at the very far away distance r, it's gonna be zero. And as you come in closer and closer, it becomes more and more negative. So the plot of the potential energy looks like this. Oops. where it eventually approaches infinity or rather negative infinity as R goes to zero. R can never actually, well, it shouldn't be exactly zero for point masses there. <laughs> and I hope this makes intuitive sense. In particular, that at some finite distance, um, in particular, that at some finite distance R prime, that your value of the potential energy is negative. And the, this is how I like to make a sense of this, that, um, that imagine uh, uh, some mass that's uh, sitting out at infinity. And tendency of everything is to go from high potential energy to low potential energy, if they could. So this will tend to kind of roll down the gravitational potential. And yeah, go, so um, some object that's very far away, it'll tend to move, uh, move towards to an object that's gravitationally attracting it. And as it does that, its potential energy goes from zero, which is the highest amount of potential energy in this, with this particular reference, it goes down to a negative value and it keeps going down to more and more negative value as the object goes from high potential energy to low potential energy. So, so yeah, uh, this is the derivation of the potential energy formula. And there will be some context where you'll need to be able to recall this formula. Uh, 